Welcome back to the show, folks. Tonight we got episode 19 of our podcast, Outside the Lab. Uh, very excited to bring to you tonight uh, a guest that you'll be very familiar with from inside the organization. Uh, has done uh, a lot uh, over the past several years uh, with Athletes Lab, kind of getting it going off the ground. Uh, a lot of behind the scenes things that, that a lot of folks don't even know about. Uh, but also uh, really, really special and important to me personally. Uh, I've known Coach Rembert since I started playing for him as a junior uh, at, at the Legion up at Post 48. Uh, I was fortunate to play under him for three years. Uh, came back, I worked under him after my junior year of, uh, of, of college. Uh, and then was very fortunate enough to, to take over as, as he stepped down um, in 2014, took over the Legion program, uh, worked under him as, as AD there. I uh, came back and did a lot there, um, has always been uh, more than just a coach to me, a uh, personal friend, mentor, uh, somebody I can go with, uh, with anything that, that comes up um, and, and know that I'm going to get honest advice uh, and the truth, and that's important to me. So, uh, again, very excited to bring to you uh, Coach Four Rembert, uh, our 9U coach at Athletes Lab, uh, but very, very, very much more than that uh, to, to a lot of people in the area. Uh, as we get going on episode 19 of the show, uh, powered by Under Armour. So, Coach, welcome to the show tonight. Thanks for being with us. Hey, always a pleasure to be with you and uh, get a chance to sit down and, and reminisce a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we'll, we'll start here. For, uh, I'm sure, like I said, most most folks listening to this are, are very familiar with you, but take us through your background, if you don't mind, uh, as as in as much detail as you want to go in there. I'll be a little, I won't be too detailed with it. So, uh, you know, I'm the oldest of five kids. You know, it's, it's me and my sister, Shannon, and then Aaron Grant and JR. And, you know, uh, most people that, you know, come to the lab are familiar with, you know, the four boys, but we do have a sister. And, um, and growing up as a kid, um, uh, I lived, uh, my dad was a high school teacher and coach, um, and mom worked for the state, uh, with social services. And so we, uh, when I was a kid, we moved around about every three to four years based on job opportunities or promotions or just relocation. And so um, I started, um, I was born in Burlington and then moved to uh, a place called Seven Lakes, which is near Pinehurst. Um, and then about age seven, uh, we moved to a place called Lake Waccamaw, which is near Whiteville. And that's where I started baseball. We moved there when I was seven. Um, I liked baseball. My dad, you know, I used to go with him to uh, Roxburgh, North Carolina, where the National Baseball Congress used to hold their, you know, what they called semi-pro back then. These were guys that, you know, were either no longer playing pro ball or never played, but great college players got together. And it was a men's league. And that was back in the 70s, the early to mid-70s for me. And I remember going there with my dad. So, um, and, and baseball down there, we didn't have little league basketball or football. So Cam, everybody, you know, really focused on baseball. So it was kind of like the sandlot all over again. And you had the sandlot all over areas down there, whether it be in Lake Waccamaw or Hallsboro, it's where Dixie youth kind of got their start uh, down in that part of the state. And uh, it just, it just grew on me from there. So uh, dad had an opportunity in 2000, uh, excuse me, in 1982 to move to Fred T. Ford. So Charlie Wyant, hired my father there. So we moved up here uh, about that time. Like I said, it was me and my sister. And then about that time, Aaron was, was a baby. And then Grant was on the way. Um, and so we lived in Hildebrand for a year, uh, got, you know, and, and then moved to Valdez where I you know went to Eastburg high school. We were there until 1996 uh, from Eastburg high school. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a, you know, do it all kind of guy, you know, growing up, I played football, basketball, baseball, and American Legion baseball. So I did that for four years um, and uh, went on to East Carolina, um, had an opportunity to go down there. Um, and, you know, I got my degree from there um, and got out and started teaching and coaching. Coaching's always been my passion. Um, I love playing the game, but I've always felt like that I you know, was put on this earth to help people. And, um, and so that's, you know, kind of my, been my passion since I was really 16, 17 years old. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, so let's, let's talk about from there. So you started off teaching and coaching, uh, at Fred T. Ford high school, correct? 
Yeah, so I did my student teaching at Chocolate High School, which is now Southside. So I, I was there in the fall, and I got my first taste of high school football as a coach under Dwayne Kellum. Uh, Dwayne won a couple of state championships at Southside High School a few years later when you know it combined with Aurora, and I had already moved back up back home after graduation and had started um, in the middle of the year at Francie Ford. Um, and so I subbed every day at, uh, at like Jacobs Fork at Francie Ford and, and was fortunate enough where Jim Norris, who was the basketball coach at Ford, said, hey, look, I know it's halfway through the year, but, you know, I want to try to help you get a, you know, get a job and get to meet people. And if nothing's open here, then maybe we could expand that. So I coached uh, – <laughs> I was a varsity assistant basketball coach, which, you know, I was, I was an observer and – uh but what's neat about this, before I go into that, is my dad coaching football and basketball and baseball at Fred T. Ford. I, I've been I've been in the gym or on the field my whole life, right? So I grew up, you know, going to practice. But what I did at a young age is I watched how coaches interacted with players. And, you know, I, I took aspects of, you know, the things that I thought they did really well that, that I could do. And then, you know, the things that they did well that I didn't feel like I could portray and, and then vice versa too, maybe doing some things that you know, probably you ought not to do. You know, I've learned that I, I learned that great lesson from my college baseball coach. You know, the you know, these are the things you should do, these are things you probably ought not to do. So it's all about experiences, you know, in life and and in getting to that point, um, and knowing that you want to coach and where you want to go and how to interact with people, what motivates them, how do you keep them coming back for more, how do you get them hungry to be the best they can be. Um, and that's one thing I think the best coaches that not necessarily, of course, they have a lot of wins, but it, it's about the player and their growth and development. It's not about the ego of the coach. You know, I never was much one for putting on a shirt with my name that said coach on it. You know, when when I was at Hickory American Legion, Roy did that. It, it, I was like, I really don't want to put Coach Rivers on there. I just want to put Post 48. He's like, no, 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 you're going to do that. I said, okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's okay. But, you know, it's all about, it's, it's about the player and making them the best they can be. So, you know, again, getting back to that, I was at Ford. Um, uh, Dwayne Finger gave me an opportunity to coach uh, JV baseball in the um, spring of, of 96, and I did that. And um, we tied for the conference championship with South Caldwell that year, which was really cool. Um, that was my first bout at it. I had, you know, some great players there. Ford, you know, seems to always have a great talent pool. Um, you know, especially with arms. And uh, what's interesting is, is I had seven starters on that JV team that got cut from the middle school team. Most of the freshmen, sophomores were playing on varsity. So they, it, there was a lot of talent there, you know, and I think I just melted, you know, molded and, and meshed in with the kids really well there. So uh, no opportunities at Fred C. Ford after that. Uh, they had a couple coaching changes and uh, they brought a couple other people in and, and decided to go different directions. So I was kind of, you know, in La La Land for about two weeks there in the summer, towards the end of the summer, um, and then uh, Maiden High School uh, uh, had given me a call. Uh, Coach Brown, Tom Brown, had needed someone to come in uh, and fill, you know, the JV football role and, and maybe be a varsity baseball assistant. Well, as soon as they got me in, within about three to four months, they went ahead and made the baseball change and gave me the job there. Um, which I was very excited about, and uh, they were looking to, you know, go ahead and make a change. There was a coach who'd been coaching that was going to be retiring in about a year or two, and I think he was ready to, you know, ready to step down and move on. And and so I got a lot of experience in Maiden. You know, I think that's where I got my most experience in learning how, you know, to do things and 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 how to motivate players, but at the same time, you know, dive down deep in that core. And you know, Coach Brown. Um, you know, did Tom Brown did such a tremendous job here at Maiden for so many years, but the influence that he and Fred Byrne had on me on how to do things, how to prepare, how to get kids motivated, you know, has been has, has been paramount in my growth as a uh, as a coach. And, um, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. Yeah, c ton of good things there that I want to kind of dive into individually before we move on to the to the next topic. Uh, one, let's go to right there where, where you finished up. Talk about the importance of having somebody or a few coaches uh, who are older than you, who have you know 10, 12, 15 years older, who have been there. They've they've been through year one. They've been through ups. They've been through downs. They've been through virtually every every situation that I'm going through as a young coach, and I've got those guys to lean on. Kind of what that does for a young coach in particular? 
Yeah, I, I tell you, the guy that you played for, who is one of my favorite people in the world, Marty Curtis, I was a very young coach. I mean, very young. And, and you know, you have guys that are in your own building, but you really don't, you know, have anybody to go to for that perspective that's outside, this outside looking in, you know, not from the inside, but outside looking in. And Coach Curtis was always available for me to, you know, give him a quick phone call that sometimes probably lasted longer than he wanted to. But he was always so patient and so good with me. And uh, Mike Mahaffey at, at Bessemer City, uh, who was a legendary coach down there, the field's named after him there. Uh, these are guys that knew my dad, that knew, you know, hey, this this kid's in it. He wants to do a good job. How can we help him? Henry Jones at Cherville. You know, Mike Grayson, uh, the Shelby Legion coach, Mike Grayson was chair, was Henry's assistant. They've been best friends for, you know, 100 years, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, they were really – these guys were really good to me. Um, and, you know, it, and, of course, you always run into situations where there's some older coaches that, you know, are, you know, kind of do their thing and they really, you know, and that's okay. But right. these guys were the ones that, that, that really, really helped out and, and helped me, you know, understand – you know, better why I do what I do and then how I go about doing it and listening to the ways that, you know, they do things and just gathering ideas and just trying to be the very best I can be for the kids that I'm trying to help. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I, and I per, speaking personally, I, I can't think, uh, and there's, there's a handful, but, but guys uh, enough for what they've done for me, uh, you know, in, in just six years of uh, you know my journey as a coach. So that's, that's incredibly important. And, and for folks listening, I would, encourage you that that whatever your uh, passion is I know we're talking about coaching doesn't have to be that to to reach out and find folks who are willing uh, to help who have been there and, and lean on their experience and their guidance and 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 kind of piggybacking off that talking about others uh, you know you mentioned and I did the same thing you know as as you're a young player once you realize hey this is what I want to do whenever I get out start to watch those guys I mean I can remember very vividly uh, as a high schooler, as a Legion player, as a college player, I mean, I, I was fully, you know, blinders on and, and invested in being the best player that I could be. But at the same time, I, you know, I was watching every move Coach Curtis, yourself, Coach Gant made thinking, you know, is, is this something that I can do? You know, what can I take from this? Because there's going to come a time shortly where that's that, that's going to be me. Uh, and how can I, you know, pick and, and choose uh, from from what they're doing? So, Again, you know, young folks in particular, whatever it is you envision yourself doing down the road, uh, you know, don't don't be so uh, locked in on what's going on in the present that you can't, you know, at, at least look, you know, and, and see what's going on from folks who are there now uh, and, and how you can benefit from that in the future. So that's that's huge. Anything you want to add there before we move on? Yeah. So, Cam, you know, I think it's important that, you know, you know again, you know, players in general, but also you know, people in general, you know, I, I try to teach my children. And of course, you know, with the business that I have and the team that, that we have there at our business at Stiefel, you know, there, there's three approaches that we try to take. We try to take a tactical approach, which is zero to 18 months out, a cyclical approach, which is three to five years out, and then a strategic approach on seven to 10 years out. I'm always thinking about, you know, my business and how I help my clients and, and, and then how I help athletes. I'm always looking 10 years out. Are there changes that, that we can make now that we know that are trending, you know, 10 years out so we can be ahead of the game? I think that's the difference in what we do at Athletes Lab than just, you know, a lot of places that you've been to, I've been to, that, you know, the, the people watching this have been to where they just get in there and throw batting practice. You know, we, we want to have a strategic, cyclical, and tactical outlook on where our players are, where our clients are, okay, and how we help them achieve and progress in goals. And the only way you can do that is through process. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to have an extreme amount of training in this on the corporate side, but what I found out was is that it relates even more closely to, you know, coaching and teaching kids and, you know, having that process in place, you know, making sure that, you know, you've got the – you know, again, they, they talk about having the right allocation. That means defining your goals and making sure that, you know, you're zeroed in on what those goals are, okay, what those what those desired outcomes are. You know, number two, making sure that you got diversification in that. That means balance in your life. You're not too heavily over or underweighted in certain areas. 
you know, of your life. Okay. Number three, everything you do and the people you interact with have to be quality. You know, it can't be the latest, coolest thing where people are trying to reinvent the game with acro you know, acronyms and all these crazy things that are coming out, you know, which innovation is a good thing, but you know, you want things that are time tested, proven and true and that work for you. Focus on that quality. Number four, have a long-term approach. That is the most important thing for baseball. You can't be caught up in the moment because baseball on the offensive side is such a game of failure. But what you got to do is say, okay, I've put in, I've put in the time. I've been efficient with it. I've learned. And now I know, you know, that over a set number of games that I'm going to have a successful outcome. So I'm going to make the adjustment and move on. And then number five, you know, how do I invest into myself and making myself better? How do I systematically invest into myself? You know, in my, you know, whether it be your grades at school, you know, your faith, you know, what, you know, what you want to do to help other people, maybe the career you have, and especially in baseball, you know, how am I systematically investing into making myself the best player I can be? You know, am, am I a boat or a big ship out in the ocean that has no destination where I'm just out, just riding around? Or do I have that clear goal and destination of this is where I want to be. Now I'm working back to it. That's what process does. That's why you always hear about Nick Saban with Alabama. You hear about Bill Parcells, you know, uh, 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 Bill Walsh, you know, the great Jimmy Johnson, the, you, Bill Cower. <clears throat> All these guys have process. They're process oriented. You know, Dabo Sweeney, you know, that he's, he's made that adoption from day one. I think when he got in the coaching profession yeah. and was smart enough to just keep going and going and going and figure out what process works you know, for what we're trying to do and always trying to redefine that. And Cam, I mentioned those five things, you know, process, you know, it, uh, you know, systematically investing into yourself as a player, right? But also when you get through playing, how do you systematically divest what you've learned into helping others? So it's kind of a 5A, right? So in life, we receive equally in proportion to what we give, okay? I think, you know, things work in balance. Things just don't happen by chance. Everything that happens is meant to happen, okay? And you have influence over that by the way that you interact with other people. So relationships are most important, you know, in life and in being able to, you know, again, systematically divest from everything that you've learned and give back and still, you know, be able to learn along the way as well. Folks, folks listening, press pause, rewind five minutes, and go watch that again, all right? Because that – uh, that's that's as good as, as it's going to get. And and for, for folks listening who don't know, um, you know, it, you guys, you Grant, uh, you, you guys have an opportunity to go out to St. Louis uh, to to these trainings um, and talk about some of the people who are out there. I mean, you, I know you mentioned some of the coaches. These are not just folks in the financial world. Uh, right, 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 right. From all all walks, all different professions there. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting how they bring these professional coaches in to coach people and. And I'll tell you, when I when I left the the, the, the public sector, um, you know, I was a teacher and coach for over, you know, for 13 years and a lifelong educator and still am to this day, you know, as far as, you know, trying to help and, you know, that kind of thing. Right. But when I left the public sector, Cam, and went into the private sector, the one thing that was interesting to me was when I was being recruited into this business, I was actually being recruited by a guy that was in the industry that was local there in Asheville where we were living at the time. And he's like, look, if you ever want a career change, you would be great at what I do. And I was like, what do you do? And he said, he said, well, he said, you know, I help people build, manage, protect and transition your wealth. And I said, well, I think that's great, but you know, where does that fit in with me? I'm a baseball and football coach. And he said, no, no, no. He said, he said, helping people is just like chess. Everything you do on the baseball field is strategic and tactical in nature. He said, so once you learn how the pieces move, in the financial world, then coaches, you know, sometimes make the best advisors because they know how to put their pieces in place to help those people achieve their goals. And so what's interesting is we have these professional, you know, business coaches come in, but they're coaching not only, you know, college and pro coaches and high school coaches that, you know, are really good, but they're coaching all these successful business people in the world, you know, that, that are CEOs of companies and, and on these conference calls and, you know, in live meetings and, and, uh, you know, I, about, I guess probably about 2011, 
I decided that, you know, it was time for me to start getting professional training in this. And how to, and, and what I found out, Kim, was it wasn't only from business, it was for my life. You know, it's made my marriage, you know, deeper and stronger. You know, it, it's 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 helped me be a better, you know, father to my children, you know, and raising them, two boys. It's helped bring clarity. It's helped, you know, and, and, and I think the one thing that I remember <laughs> that was so profound was it said the, the guy that was trained us asked in, in the audience, he said, raise your hand if you seek greatness. Well, everybody does. Everybody raises their hand. Of course they seek that. And he said, well, he said, if you if you want to seek greatness, forget that and start seeking truth and then you'll have both. And so that's why when you deal with me and Grant, <laughs> that yeah. we lead with truth and, and it's not meant to hurt feelings, it's meant to clear everything out so we can move forward. And um, yeah, I think that's very important. I think, you know, you even, you know, playing for me, you know, we always dealt in truth. That's right. With the players. And, and, you know, we said, Hey, we'll get them next time. Or, Hey, you need to do this better. Or you're not, you're not very good right now. And this is why we need to, you know, work on these things. Um, or, Hey, you're doing a great job, but that way people can trust what you're saying and know that you're not just saying things. And well, and, and, yeah, and, and, and to that point, and, and the folks, I, I mean, I, I want you to hear this. Grant sat there last night and told our, our, our older showcase guys, like, you deserve nothing less than that. You don't deserve to, to have things sugarcoated. You deserve to have the honest, you know, straightforward truth told to you because that's what's in your best interest. And you're not going to get better unless you're told the truth. Doesn't mean we don't like you. Doesn't mean, you know, that's not what we're talking about. But you have to speak and you have to deal in truth. And 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 here's what I want to go back to. You, you started with this talking about your background and, and early days of coaching. And, you know, and you're talking about how, how the, the, the chess pieces fit together, you bring in your marriage, you talk about being a father. It all goes back to when you were talking about coaching. It's all about the player. It's all about that person. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter if it's a player. Doesn't matter if it's your spouse. Doesn't matter if it's your your, your child, your client, whoever it is. If that's at the forefront, then the other things, you know, the uh, the five different principles you're talking about, they're all going to fall in line because it's all geared uh, in in the right direction. So, uh, awesome stuff there. I, I do want to go in a little bit deeper with two of those five things. Uh, first, being quality people uh, from from day one in September of 2018 when Grant called me. Uh, the whole conversation centered around uh, we've got to get quality people first. This this athlete's lab, this vision, this whole thing has no chance to take off unless the right people are in place. So talk about your experience, whether it's coaching you know, in, in, in your world now, wherever, uh, about the importance of quality people being surrounded. Yeah, so if you'll notice, um, you know, anytime that I would coach a team, um, you know, in the last 20 years, it – in this area, if Robbie Abernathy was available, that's the first person I would go to to say, Hey, can you come out here and help me with this? You know, he, he and I coached uh, football together at Maiden. He was uh, the assistant coach of the state championship team here at Maiden uh, back in 1999, our baseball championship team. And, and um, you know, it, rock, you know, you need that solid rock that's going to do everything that you need done and you can depend on them. And, and that's where you start with a foundation. You know, the one thing that I realized was, when I, even when I was a head football coach many years ago, was, you know, I don't really need a bunch of Bill Belichicks around me. At that time, it was Bill Parcells, right? Belichick was still, you know, kept, you know, still making his way through. Um, you know, I, what I need is, is, is some guys that have experience, but also we can all get on the same page for the benefit of the kid. You know, I don't want anybody making it about them, or, or, you know, just being there. You know, I want these players to have quality surrounded with them, and it was my job to filter that. And I think you'll you'll notice, you know, when you played for me with Legion or, you know, with anything that I do in my life, you know, I make sure that I surround myself with quality people. Um, you know, even with, you know, our business that we have at Stiefel, um, you know, our clients, you know, we, we, we interview them. We just don't take anybody that has any amount of money or anything like that. It has to be for the benefit of, and all transactions have to be mutually beneficial. I think in life, if you're expecting something for nothing, then it will crumble before you. Okay. I think that all transactions and they don't have to be, mon you know, they don't have to be money, right. but the transaction has got to be, you know, beneficial and mutual. So it can grow 
and has that solid foundation. Yeah, all, awesome stuff there. And and I think what's important there is, and like you said, and again, we're talking coaching, but it doesn't have to be that, is the, those folks, those quality people, your circle, like you said, they don't have to be uh, the brain power, you know, behind everything. I think Robbie would be the first to tell you, Robbie's a football guy. Robbie was probably a, a baseball coach secondarily. I mean, football was his thing. But Robbie can flat out coach. Right. And 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 Robbie's got the the, the best interest of kids. And I know that because I I played under him at, at the at the Legion. Um, so it can't can't overstate enough the importance of people. Uh, and we've got that. I mean, you look from from the top down in the organization, the recent hires that, that have been made uh, with, with Aldra and with, with Ryan and people coming on. Uh, I mean, people people are there. Um, and, and, and that's important. The second one I talk about is what was number five in, invest in yourself. Um, and, and I, I say this, I think every podcast, every chance I get the year is 2020. There's never been more opportunity out there to invest in yourself than right now. Uh, and maybe even more so during this, during this coronavirus time. I mean, there, there are resources, there are people constantly. I mean, you, your email can get flooded daily if you want with newsletters, with videos, with people trying to help opportunities are there take advantage. And that's one thing that we're trying to do at Athletes Lab. I mean, whether it's virtual workouts with, with Ryan and Aldra, uh, whether it's, you know, technology side of things coming in, whatever. I mean, it's it's a one-stop shop for you to fully invest in yourself. And now it's up to you to to do that. So uh, talk about that and expand a little bit on that for us. Yeah. So, you know, investment in yourself, it's all got to start, you know, with you doing something that a lot of people don't do. And that's think. You need to be able to think for yourself. We're in an information age. We don't need to just wander around and do what everybody says because they say do it. We need to understand that there's purpose so we can attach passion to what we're trying to achieve. Okay. When you come over to the lab and, you know, you and Grant and, you know, whether I'm working with my nine new kids or, you know, whatever it may be, um, you know, we need to have purpose. And we need to have passion with that purpose. And in order to do that, we have to teach kids to think. This is why you're doing this. And this is the benefit of it. Now, you know, a lot of times they don't fully understand that, but it gives them an opportunity to start thinking about it. And then how do they become better? How do you invest in yourself? So after you start thinking about things, then, you know, you start watching things, you know, your videos on hitting. You know, maybe have your mom and dad record you and Grant as far as what you're teaching in a, you know, a, a 30 second segment, you know, where they're that way you can watch that. You watch yourself. You know, I, there's going to be a lot of teaching tools and instant feedback that's being you know purchased and, and and will be available to the players, you know, in the lab as far as, you know, being able to see exit velocity and, you know, and, and, and the like. Right. Um you know, and, and that's very important for that instant feedback. But the depth of learning and having a fundamental understanding of why you don't drop your backside when you swing, you know, why, you know, why it's so important, you know, to get that knee, you know, that triggering mechanism, have a fundamental understanding and understand that failure is a part of success. It's amazing to me that our greatest teacher is failure, but yet nobody wants their kid to fail at anything. You know, failure is our greatest teacher. And, you know, what we try to do is, is make things easier. Sometimes it's better to seek failure so you know now how not to do it. So then you have a broader base to continue to be better at what you do. So investing in yourself is investing in your failures, you know, learning from those. You know, my greatest successes have come from my largest failures, you know, both in life and, you know, professionally speaking. And the intent is always to do good or to try to help. But I, you know, I have to understand that. And that way I'm able to have a long-term strategic approach in helping people and not worried about what happened in the short term, you know, because we're all human and, you know, investing in yourself means growth and development, you know, on that major part, you know, which is your relationship with your faith, you know, in God. And then the pillars branch out from it. You know, a lot of people talk about having a three-legged stool or four-legged stool. Mine is a single wide bar stool that goes straight up in faith. And then off of that are the parts of my life, you know, and the things that I do. Okay. So, you know, the physical, the mental, the health, you know, all of those things, right. But they come off of my, you know, spiritual side. Right. Um, I think that's very important. And, you know, again, 
you know, I'm the first person to tell you that, you know, God didn't put me here to be a preacher, but I, you know, personally, I'm very strong in that and in my faith. And I think that's very important to, you know, have that fundamental understanding of a greater good and greater cause, and then trying to help other people. And I always tell my players, whether they're nine years old or 19 years old, you played, be your best you. Be your best you. If you have to ask, should I do that or not? Then you probably ought not to do it, right? You know, try to make the best decisions and then invest in yourself and invest in your long-term growth all the time. Look 10 years out on everything you do. If you're a player right now, look five years out. Where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in five years after that? And then that way you're always looking down the road and trying to make yourself better and reaching that goal. And when you do that, it doesn't allow you to get caught up in short-term setbacks. We learn and we move on. And that's huge. And and, and talking about spending your time there, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, both as a player and then after, you know, uh, later on in life, you always said was, was uh, if it's not going to matter in five years, don't worry about it. Yeah. It don't matter, right? If, if, if it's not in that long-term plan and long-term uh, approach, then, then it really doesn't matter right now. Uh, and that's what I would encourage our, our players, no matter what age you're at, uh, and those five years may be sped up for some of our older guys who are sophomores and juniors. But if it's not going to matter down the road, then what are you doing? Right. And invest in the things that are uh, aligned with where you see yourself um, and, and where you want to be. So I, I think that's huge. Also talking about failure. I mean, that's 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 incredibly important. And I, and I wrote that quote down. Failure is our greatest teacher. Yet no one wants to fail. That's that's pretty uh, that's pretty powerful there. Um, and, and, and really, uh, you know, you hear this all the time. There's there's really not winners and losers. There's winners and learners if you're willing to learn from your failures. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I hope people will, will will go back and listen and, and take that to heart. Coach, I want to switch gears. Um, for, for those who have been following us on Wednesdays, we've, we've stayed inside the organization. We've worked our way down from 14U uh, we were with uh, 11U, and then we went to our strength coaches. I should be on 10U next, uh, but skipped to 9U, and that was intentional because of, of the significance of this week uh, in your life and in the life of your uh, of your brothers. For those who don't know, uh, in 1999, this week, uh, Coach Rembert and uh, uh, Bunk and, uh, and Grant and Aaron all won the, the state championship uh, against Bladenboro uh, in 99. Um, so, Coach, I want to spend some time talking about that, but I want to start. I want to start here. I don't. I don't know what the situation was uh, with the baseball program when you got to uh, to Maiden. Uh, obviously, that they hadn't won a ton of state championships prior to that. But I do know, I do know you, you've talked about at Fred T. Ford, seven starters were cut in middle school. I know at, at post 48, your first year in 08 or 09, I think 08, um, didn't have a ton of numbers, extremely young. Steph's a, Steph's a sophomore, all right? Hoyle is a freshman. Um, so talk about when you first get there, and we can focus in on, on Maiden, when you first get there, setting expectations – demanding excellence, what that looks like, and then we'll get to how that translates two or three years later into state titles. Okay, yeah, great. So when I got to Maiden, I'd been coaching uh, JV football there for about for about a month and a half, two months, and Miss Long, Debbie Long, our principal, calls me in, and she says, Ford, we want to offer you the baseball job. Uh, we talked about you being an assistant this year, but we want to go ahead, and you know, I was 22, 23 years old, whatever. And, you know, I feel like I was ready for that at a smaller, you know, school that hadn't had a lot of success. So Maiden won like three games in five years or something, something like that and didn't have a JV team. So the first thing I said is, Miss Long, you know, if we're going to have a successful program here and not just have a team, we got to have a JV team to feed and build into the program. So Coach Brown, athletic director, is like, absolutely, let's do that. We want to get this thing up and running. You know, we got some young blood in here. Let's go with it. So I told him, you know, I saw our football players and Maiden has traditionally been pretty good in football and basketball and uh, had good athletes. And I told Miss Long, I said, look, I think in three years, based on what I'm seeing with these younger kids and who I'm coaching, that we have a chance to at least compete in the state playoffs and maybe, you know, for a championship at some point. Well, everybody laughed. They appreciated my young and my enthusiasm, you know, my driving desire. Hey, you go get them. Great job, big guy. You know, ha, 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 pat you on the back. I said, okay. So I had a meeting a week later with the players in the library or the guys that wanted to come out. And, you know, I told them the first thing I said in the meeting is, if you don't think we can win a state championship this year, you need to leave. There were three kids that got up and left. 
Wow. Well, what that did was, and, and I did this on purpose because I wanted to eliminate anybody that didn't believe. I didn't care if it was year one. Our focus was not winning a ball game. It was not winning a conference championship. It was not winning the Easter tournament. It wasn't getting to, you know, the second round. Okay. I wanted to set the bar high because what happens in life, Cam, is people set the bar low and hit it and think that's success. I want to set it as high as we could possibly go, which was a state championship that I knew in my mind was going to take some time to do, but I wanted the mindset and mentality that way. You can't achieve anything in life until your mindset is, this is what I'm going to do. It's not what I'm going to hope to do. It's what I'm going to do because what happens when you do that every day and that's all you think about as far as that end result, okay, and that you've got to follow a process to get there, then all of a sudden it becomes infectious with the people around you. You know, you did that at post 48 when you played for me. I didn't talk about winning the Area 4 championship ever. I talked about us getting to the state championship. And your last year playing, guess where we went? That's right. Also the mindset. Okay. So that's the big thing is getting people to understand, especially players, this is where you want to be. If you want to be a college baseball player, then you need to start checking all the things off that are going to get you there at whatever level you're able to compete at. And you have to do that. So that was the mindset that I set with the kids. So the first year we went three and 19. We won the first game of the season against East Lincoln, five to four. Incredible. I I mean, it was, I had 10 varsity players and 10 JV players had to remove four seniors before our first game because, you know, they wanted to still do things their way. That, that was not what was in the vision. And so I asked them to go ahead and, retire early so we could play our young, you know, so we could move on with the program. So the next year we come back and then all of a sudden we're, we're, we're 12 and eight and finished third in our conference. Now our conference, we switched from the SD seven that year to the Southern Piedmont one, a two, a, let me give you the two, one, a schools, Maiden and Cherville. Let me give you the five, two, a schools, Bessemer city, West Lincoln, Lincolnton, who won a state championship two years earlier. Right. Shelby and Bessemer City. <clears throat> now, you think the SD7 was tough in football. You tried going to the Southern Piedmont 1A2A and playing baseball. The bad part was is we had the second best 1A team in the state that year. But <laughs> Terrible had Ralph Roberts and all those guys that played at Carolina and Thomas Pruitt that you know played at Western two sport, you know, just amazing athletes. They had like six kids on that team that played college baseball. All right, amazing. So then they only took one representative from our conference in the 1A because there was only two 1A, so they took Cherville, and they should have. Cherville was better. But we were the second-best 1A team in the state that year. And, you know, one thing that I did was I never scheduled easy non-conference games. So I scheduled, like, Providence High School, South Caldwell, St. Stephen's, you know, the bigger school. Bunker Hill was always on our schedule when they weren't in our conference because I wanted to play Marty Curtis and his players because I knew they were prepared and that they would make us better for our conference run, right? So when it was time to make that run in 99, you know, I was still very young. I was 26 years old. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got the horses in the stable. We've been preparing nonstop for two years. And by the way, 15 of my 18 players on the state championship team played football. And a lot of them played basketball too. So they were multi-sport athletes. Okay. Now that doesn't mean they neglected going out and hitting and throwing and things like that, but they were multi-sport athletes, kind of like yourself. You know, they, they wanted the experience of trying to become a better athlete through skillful movement in other sports. And that's, you know, that's what happens. But the most important thing was they were competitors and their, their goal was, you know, it, unfortunately at that time we had to win a conference championship or finish better than charitable to get to the state playoffs. Well, we, we did that and uh, we're able, you know, after Rocky start, uh, which was completely on me being a young coach after Rocky start, we got everything together got everybody going the right direction and the rest was history. You know, it was really cool. You know, I I still in touch, you know, with, with the guys that played on my team, I know where they are, what they're doing, you know, whether, you know, what they're doing in their lives. Uh, You know, these are great guys and forever relationships. I do a post on Facebook. I just did one of the last two days on, you know, each player, just kind of a recap. I try to do that like every year just to, you know, it's that it's this time of year. You know, the state championship we won it on the 29th of May in 1999. That'll be, I think, this Friday. You know, it was on a Saturday and we won it then. You know, 97 degrees, incredibly hot down in Raleigh. We had to play at Garner High School because they were redoing 
uh, Mudcat Stadium down there uh, where Carolina Mudcats played in Zebulon. And then uh, NC State, so could only host three teams. So they did 2 8 3 4 8 State. And we played a state championship at Garner. Hey, fine, no problem, right? So we went and did that. And, you know, the experience was great. Um, I think, you know, there, it's very special having coached all three of my brothers on that state championship team. Um, you know, it, it was really neat. Um, you know, great experience. Uh, but, you know, I think the thing that I took the most pride in was is that, you know, Henry Jones, the legendary coach at Cherville, he told me, he said, four, he said, I could never tell that those guys were your brothers. He said it was amazing how they just melded in with the rest of the things that you did with the team. And I purposely did that. Now, you know, there, there's some challenges when you coach your brothers or your son that you got to go through. And, you know, it wasn't, it's not really being about harder on them than everybody else. I just think you need to make them part of the process and not hide it. Like, you know, with, with them, I would not let them call me Coach Rembert. I made them call me four because they were my brother and I didn't want the kid, you know, I didn't want to go overboard with it. Right. You know, that, but, you know, like when I coach, you know, Garrick, you know, he's not to call me coach. He's to call me dad. You know, that way it lets everybody know, yeah, he is my son, but that's where it stops. And then, you know, I'm no harder on him than I am anybody else. I make the experience whole. And I learned that from coaches like Dickie Foster, Fred T. Ford. That, you know, I saw do that, you know, when my dad coached there a long time. Jerry Copas, legendary basketball coach there. You know, there's a lot of people that influenced that decision making and how you mold that together you know, for the benefit of all the kids there. And not one player on our team could ever say, yeah, he was playing because he was the coach's brother. That's ridiculous. They were held to the same standard every day as everybody else. And what was neat was is we didn't have starters on that state championship team. We had guys that competed for their position every day. And you had to bring it. We slid headfirst into every base every day as part of our practice. And people say, oh, you're crazy. You're going to get people hurt. Well, the game went and run in game three crossed the plate in a head first slide, beating the throw from the backstop because he didn't go feet first because he knew how to avoid the tag and reach out with his hand and grab the plate. Chance favors the prepared mind and the prepared body and yeah. Yeah, part of getting to a championship. And again, that all melts back to that mentality. And, and I will tell you that people laughed when I told them that, you know, I really feel like we can do great things here. And, you know, and, and, and that was just even more motivating factor, you know, to be able to try to get to where we were and reach that pinnacle and then try to start it all over again. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, and, 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 and I think I don't think I know uh, all of our coaches at the youth level at Athletes Lab, uh, their son is on the team. Uh, so I think there's some stuff to be learned from that. Uh, and uh, about how you handled that and meshed that together with with three brothers. But I want to go go back to the beginning, and, and and vision and mindset was the big thing there in those opening meetings. Uh, to me, th three things happened. One, you, you created the vision. There's no doubt uh, you, you you had it, uh, and it started with you. Two, uh, maybe the tough one is you got to sell it. Like you're saying, there's people who's going to laugh. There's people who are going to get up and walk out of the meeting, but you got to sell it and get the buy-in. All right. But then once that happens. Then you just go to work. You start checking off boxes like you say. And I think what's important, and this is what I want people to hear, is I don't know what Maiden's record was the, the year before you got there. You said a three and 19 in year one. It don't matter if you're the defending state champion or if you didn't win a game the year before, if you're not talking about whatever the pinnacle is. And again, we're talking about sports, but whatever your, your thing is, if you're not talking about the pinnacle and working toward it, not just talking about it, but working toward it with those process steps, what are you doing? Hey, you're, you're out there wasting time. Um, and, and that's the important part is, look, doesn't matter where you're at now. All right. It matters that you, you've got an idea where you're going and you know how to get there. And then you go to work. Then you go back to things we're talking about. Invest in yourself. Surround yourself with quality people. And it, 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 it all comes full circle. Uh, and then, you know, look up three years later and there you are, state, state champion. So uh, that's I feel like that's the blueprint right there. Uh, and, and, and very cool stuff. So, yeah, I, I would have been. Remiss not to mention, uh, you know, the 99 state championship team and what a what a special week that was and, and continues to be, as you said, for for you and for those guys and their families and really the whole town and school. Uh, so so cool stuff there. Coach, let's finish up talking about Athletes Lab. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about your 9U team. I know you guys are uh, getting back to practicing and starting to uh, uh, think about tournaments. 
Um, got plans to stay pretty local. So that's that's awesome for those guys that they'll uh, finally, hopefully get a chance to get back out there. But talk about kind of what you've seen, because um, it's kind of interesting. You're, you're hands on, but at the same time, sometimes you're kind of hands off back in the background, you know, doing all, all sorts of things that people may or may not know related to Athletes Lab. But talk about how you've uh, how you've kind of seen the, the place really take off in, in a matter of two to three years. Oh, yeah. So, you know, Grant, you know, had been, you know, working, you know, over across town in a you know, smaller facility and and, you know, was quickly outgrowing that. You know, I'd, I'd come over on Saturdays and take a look at things and, you know, jump in there every now and then, um, you know, just to see what was happening. And, and it, people were showing up, I mean, just in massive droves. And of course, as you know, you, you were in there as well. And, you know, we had it on multiple levels. And I think, you know, when Grant and I started planning this thing out, you know, the big thing was, was getting our brother, you know, Aaron to, you know, decide if it was time for him to make a career move and get down here. Um, you know, that, I think that was, you know, having, having you already here um, was, you know, a really solid piece of the puzzle. And having Aaron come down helped complete what was needed to get things up and going and to, you know, expand. Um, you know, Grant, you know, has always had the vision of training, um, you know, being the most important aspect. And, and i got to tell you, my, my state championship team at Maiden or my post-48 team, you know, we focused on training, you know, more so than we did playing the game. You know, when you train a program, the game comes pretty easy. And, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, we – you know, we, we always talk about and, and the way that the lab is, is set out. And we looked at the building, which, you know, ironically is across the street from, you know, both our houses here in Maiden. When I went and first looked at it, I said, dude, I, you know, I think this is great, but, you know, you're going to have to draw this out. I've got to see this because that I had been looking at that building for 20 years and I was like, there's no way. Well, when we got in and started seeing the layout, what we could take out and the functions that we had and some of the, repurposing, you know, that could be done to it. Um, and the fact that one of my former players, Casey Byrne, you probably, you know, everybody probably sees Casey every oh, yeah. some work. He is a master craftsman and he can build and fix and, and enhance anything. So once we knew we had all these pieces in place and of course a good friend of mine owned the building and his health had been declining and you know, he came to Grant, Grant had some conversations with him and I saw him out one day and he said, I really hope you guys can do this. So Grant and I said, you know what, we're going to pull the trigger. And so, um, you know, we got some stuff together, um, you know, and, you know, you know, my role in this is, 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 is the silent partner. Okay. You know, I, I don't want any financial part of this. You know, I just want to be able to help and support and, you know, make sure that the athletes and their parents have all the available means to be the very best they can be. Okay. And to utilize those means and, you know, I love my town here in Maiden. I love living here. Um, and, and I wanted to see, you know, another business move in that brought quality and value, you know, and service. You know, if a business isn't doing well, it, 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 it's, it, it's ultimately because the service model is just not, just not intact. And we want that here. We want the service model, you know, which is the player and development to be first and foremost. And, you know, coming in and, and working, you know, I'm, you know, I come over and, you know, take a look at things. I work with my 9U team. I've worked with the 15U, you know, my other son, Quinn, you know, plays on this. So I kind of feel in there when needed, <laughs> you know, just to, you know, just to be there and, and, and you know, have, some, you know, have somebody has got experience working with the kids, and, you know, getting things the way they need to be. And, you know, you know, my, you know, my place in all of this is, is to be of support and help and, you know, be there as a means of stability, somebody that's been there, done that, has had success that, you know, is, you know, basically unquestioned and undeniable, you know, but yet still wants to engage and learn as much as he can to help those kids. Yeah. I think that's what it's all about. And, you know, just bringing that aspect over there every day to, you know, help, help you help grant, help the players, the kids that come through there, even the pro kids that come through the college kids that are training right now you know, giving them a sense of direction and, um, you know, just, just trying to help. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and, and help you do no, no doubt. Uh, but again, go back to what, you know, what we've been talking about. I think it all started, uh, with a vision, uh, with Grant 
uh, it got sold. I know I bought it, uh, you know, jumped in with, with, with both feet and hadn't looked back and then go to work. Uh, and, and that's the main part, you know, put your head down, go to work, start checking off those process boxes like you're talking about. Two years later, here we are uh, and, and continuing to get better every day. That's 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 the thing uh, We're we've never arrived. We're always becoming. Uh, and that's that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, Coach, I'm going to wrap it up here. If there's any final words, any any comments you want to add to leave our folks with. It's yours. Yeah, absolutely, Cam. Um, you know, it, it's always good to be able to you know sit down with you. Uh, we've done this more than once, just privately. You know, just me and you, or me and you and Lauren, or you know whoever. But uh, you know, I think the main thing is 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 coming to the lab. You know, understand that when you come in, there's purpose and there's passion. You keep re- redefining what your goals are. You know what you want to do to be the best player you can be. Understand the realm of the recruiting process. You know, how do I make myself available to what's needed in the open market as far as baseball goes? Am I being realistic with my goals? All right. And make sure that your goals are always specific, measurable, you know, attainable, right? Yeah. Yeah. All of these things, okay, that 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 will help you get to where you want to go. And, um, you know, when the kids come in, we're always available to chat with parents, you know, talk to them about process, any of those things that will help them be better. And, you know, we'll sit down, we'll have a truthful conversation about things and, you know, never, you know, never underestimate the power of desire. There's 13 principles, guiding principles that help people succeed in life. The first one is desire, having the desire to do something when you've got the desire. The other 12 just roll off and it's, you know, it's just one of those things. And, you know, I I want our kids that come in there, you know, the trained males, females, we want you to be the best you you can be. And, you know, that's the message that that's most important. That's awesome. Uh, Wise words as always. I I can't wait to go back and watch this one and take a second page of notes. I've got a full page now as of, as I've been going through this uh, in real time, but coach can't thank you enough for your time uh, carving out an hour for us here. Uh, Folks, that'll do it for episode 19. Tune in Friday for another great episode of Outside the Lab uh, brought to you by the Performance Center and powered by Under Armour. Have a good evening.